Okay, today what we want to do is more or less say that we've uh, gone through most of the things in Chen that we want to and those things in Bittencourt. And we want to go into uh, basically controlled thermonuclear fusion, or really, let's call it an introduction uh, to controlled fusion. Uh, of course, uh, uh, controlled fusion is a rather large subject, it turns out. Uh, and I'll have to explain what some of these words really mean. Uh, and we really cover this more in some other courses, um, such as uh, there's a 527 called um, plasma confinement and heating. There's a 536 called uh, fusion reactor design considerations. And then there's uh, special topics courses that get taught from time to time. But basically, a lot of what of the development of plasma science, um, the science of plasma, understanding plasmas and being able to experimentally manipulate them and so forth, has in large part been funded over the last 30, 40 years, as I'll comment on later here, uh, by desire to understand the plasma well enough and control it well enough to achieve controlled thermonuclear fusion. So it is quite appropriate, even though this will be a li little bit more of a kind of nuclear physics, well, not nuclear physics, a summary of some nuclear physics information uh, talk today, or discussion today, and some perspective on fusion. Uh, and then the remaining two lectures, what we'll do is talk about mirror confinement uh, and uh, tokamak or toroidal confinement. So first, let's talk about the basic uh, fusion reactions. And these are probably moderately familiar to people, but I want to stress some particular aspects. The first, um, I guess I'll say aspect, is let's understand what the difference between fission and fusion is. And so let us make a plot of the how deeply bound various nuclei are in their nuclei, nucleons are in their nuclei. Uh, and so let's, calc let's look at the binding energy in MeV per nucleon. So this is how deeply bound is a particular particle as a function of the atomic number of the particular um, nucleus. And what you find is a curve that looks nominally like this. And on this curve, if I'm out here at, say, 235, that would be uranium. And what I, of course, do is I inject or collide a neutron with the uranium nucleus. And what happens is that this uh, splits into two fission products or nuclei plus couple of neutrons to sustain the reaction. Uh, and the basic idea is that this uranium atom is sitting here, and the two nuclei that it uh, splits into, so-called fission products, are at roughly half, uh, should go over a little further, I guess, uh, roughly half the mass of the uranium uh, nucleus. But on the other hand, because they are more deeply bound than the uranium nucleus is, uh, I gain energy, I gain this amount of binding energy. So that is, of course, the process of fission split apart, of course. Fusion is completely at the opposite end of this particular diagram. Namely, we start over here with hydrogen, deuterium, tritium, and so forth. And we combine various light elements of various light nuclei, uh, basically uh, T and D and, and so forth. Um, we fuse them together. And we end up fusing them into things like helium, which is a very tightly bound nucleus or an alpha particle. Uh, and by, again, going to more deeply bound particles within the nucleus, we gain this differential in energy, a few MeV, it turns out. Um, so th this is down around 1, 2, and so forth. 
What, by the way, is the most deeply bound thing on this uh, diagram? Anybody know? Yeah, it's good old iron. Everything burns nuclear-wise to iron, right? So there's sort of 56, here's iron. And indeed, fusion reactions in the sun, say, are burning in this direction towards iron. Many stars are trying to burn out towards iron. Our heavy nuclei, we're visioning back towards iron, let's roughly speaking. But anyway, so the basic idea then is that either you split something apart with a neutron called fission, or you combine light nuclei, fuse them together, and gain energy by putting them together into more deeply bound particles. Now, the particular reactions, um, so let me just say fission versus fusion. And then let me point to that. Now, the particular reactions that we're interested in are a number. So let me start writing them down. The most prominent one which we deal with in the fusion business is called uh, a D plus T. Uh, goes to an alpha particle with 3.52 MeV uh, plus uh, a neutron which has 14.06 MeV. That's a pretty energetic neutron. It turns out that if you want this to happen, you, of course, if you have a deut deuteron and a triton, they're both positively charged ions, and so I have to overcome the Coulomb potential barrier. So there is a threshold for this reaction, and the threshold is about 4 kiloelectron volts, 4, 4.5 kiloelectron volts. Um, now, a question might be, um, where am I going to get deuterium and where am I going to get tritium? Well, deuterium turns out to be a one part in 6,500 isotope in all, all uh, H, like, you know, the H2O, the, the hydrogenic uh, species in uh, water. So I got a lot of that. Where do I get tritons? Well, a little bit the problem we've got is that tritons decay in a half-life of 12.3 years. So we have to get the tritons from someplace. And what you do is you take the neutron, for instance, the one you get out of this reaction, you collide that with a lithium-6 lithium nucleus, which is, turns out the 7.4% abundant uh, species of lithium, uh, or isotope of lithium, and this goes to a triton, which again is 12.3 years half-life, um, plus an alpha particle, helium-4, um, plus 4.8 MeV. Now, uh, it turns out the other isotope, other prominent isotope of um, lithium, namely the uh, lithium-7, which is uh, the greater than 90% isotope, uh, can also go to a, a triton plus a helium-4 plus a neutron, which is good. You get your neutron back. The only trouble is, in contrast to this reaction, which is exothermic, this reaction is endothermic, uh, and so there's a loss of 2.5 MeV in this process, which is okay if I was taking that 14 MeV neutron out, out and putting in a blanket and colliding. I've got some energy to give up. So now, uh, there's a little bit of accounting I need to do on the side to tell you how people in the fusion business kind of count, count energy. So suppose I was trying to figure out in a fusion plasma how much total energy I receive or obtain for each deuterium-tritium fusion. Well, first off, let's note that we get 3.5 MeV, 3.52 MeV, into a, a helium-4, and that's an alpha particle, and it will be positively charged, right? So actually, that could be, you know, comes off as a charged particle, stays right in the plasma, and it heats the plasma, okay? So that's good. I can have a self-heating if I can arrange things right, if the Larmor radius is small enough and it's well confined and so forth. On the other hand, most of my energy in this reaction is, in fact, coming out in the neutron. Is that going to stay in the plasma? No, there's not much interaction of a neutron with a rather not very dense plasma. So that goes out 
into some walls and so forth and so on. So the amount of energy that you get from any given okay, DT reaction is 17.6 MeV per, let's see, I don't know, per DT reaction. But notice that of that, about 20% is in this 3.5 MeV that might get absorbed in the plasma, and the other has got to be absorbed in some surrounding blanket. So there's a certain element that we'll come back to that uh, only 20% goes into the particles, charged particles that stay in the plasma. Now, some people get a little ambitious, though, or hopeful, maybe is the way to say it, that well, they will design a blanket around the plasma, which will get recover, which will, in the process of producing the tritium, get me this additional 4.8 MeV. So some people refer to the energy available from a DT reaction as not just 17.6 MeV, but uh, rather for this additional 4.8 MeV, which then gives me a total of 22.4 MeV um, using the amount of energy that I will actually get from the lithium-6 reactions if I had pure lithium-6. So anyway, there are various amounts of energy that people sometimes quote for how much uh, energy you will get if you are able to um, do uh, controlled fusion. We'll get back to how that all works in a moment. Okay, now there's some other reactions. So let's call this um, other fusion reactions. Um, the DT is, as we'll see, the easiest, the first, uh, and so forth. But you can imagine uh, DD reactions by themselves, which go with roughly equal probability to either a triton with 1.01 MeV uh, plus a proton, which is all then cho totally charged particles, or with equal probability, 50-50 probability on these, um, helium-3 at 0.82 MeV plus a neutron with 2.45 MeV. Now, this, these reactions have a threshold energy, again, to overcome the Coulomb bar barrier of about um, 35 kiloelectron volts. And where do I get deuterium? Well, as we mentioned a moment ago, one in seawater or any typical water, uh, one, there's one deuterium nucleus per 6,500 hydrogen nuclei. Uh, in, I'm going to call it H in quotes 2O because it's almost all hydrogen, but it's got little deuterium. And people have calculated, or you can calculate quite easily if you neglect certain efficiency factors or don't worry about them, that one cubic kilometer of seawater okay, in energy is equivalent to 1,360 billion barrels of crude oil, which is, depending on whose estimates you use, of the order of the world reserves in crude oil. So if you're able to do fusion energy-wise, you, you know, have achieved quite an energy source is the basic idea. Uh, cubic kilometer seawater is equal to all the crude oil we think we have. Another way of stating this, which was actually a problem in um, Betancourt, is that it turns out one liter of seawater is then an energy equivalent uh, it's energy in, is energy equivalent to uh, 300 liters of gasoline. So uh, all that seawater might come to good use in time, or at least a part of it. So this is an additional fusion reaction. Uh, further, uh, of prominence particularly around here, is another reaction, <coughs> D-helium-3, uh, gives you an alpha particle, helium-4, 3.67 MeV. Um, plus a proton, which is 14.67 MeV. Now this has a fair amount of energy coming off, and in contrast to the DT reaction, notice that there, these are both charged particles, helium-4 and protons. But <clears throat> if you 
had a plasma with the helium-3 in it, it would produce some protons, some helium-4, and then by virtue of those colliding, you'll eventually get some tritons out of the DD, or you get some DD reactions, so forth and so on. So you, if you consider the whole fuel cycle, you'll also get neutron production out of this. Uh, this particular reaction, the D-helium-3 reaction, has a threshold energy, um, again, of about 30 kiloelectron volts. Where do I get helium-3, by the way? Well, beta decay of a triton is one way, but where do I get the tritons then is kind of the question there. And, you know, there is, there is some of that available, but not very much. So where I really get helium-3 is it turns out the surface of the moon has been proposed. The surface of the moon is, uh, has been, had a lot of solar wind coming into it over a few, you know, million years and hundreds of millions of years. And so uh, pragmatically... Uh, it's been it's uh, impregnated with a lot of helium-3. So the proposal is that it's actually energy by a factor of 100 or so. Uh, advantage Energy-wise, it's advantageous to send um, space shuttles up, pick up some helium-3, bring it back to Earth, and burn it, and you'll get more energy out by a couple orders of magnitude than you expended in going and getting it. Now, so let's now take a look at, well, suppose we wanted to do these fusion reactions. So these are the basic fusion reactor reactions. Suppose we want to utilize them to do um, fusion. How do we look at, you know, what's my reaction rate? How many reactions am I going to get? What kind of density do I need of particles and so forth and so on? Well, the first thing we need to do is to talk about something called the cross-section. And by cross-section, what we mean, of course, is I'm, I'm a, say, triton traveling along, and there's a bunch of or deuterium ions here. And the question is, how big a interaction distance is, uh, do I get for the triton hitting that deuteron? And, of course, what we uh, call that is a cross-section, sigma, which is sort of a water pi times a nuclear interaction distance squared. How big is a typical nuclear interaction distance? Well, it turns out the interaction distance for nucle uh, nuclear interaction distance is on the order of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Okay? So I take pi r squared, and you find that this is in the order of, it's a little larger than that, just it's a little larger than 10 to the minus 13. Anyway, so... It's typically, you typically measure cross-sections in units of 10 to the minus 24th centimeter squared, which is equal to one barn. So the question is, what is the cross-section? You know, how big does the triton see the inter as it moves towards a deuteron? How big does it see that interaction distance in which it's going to interact? And for this, you have to go and look at nuclear data that's been uh, accumulated by people over the years, and we'll just uh, make a, a chart of this. And I might say this, um, my particular graphs come out of Miyamoto or Rosenclark or Gla Glastone and Loveberg, various books that I've um, given you references for. And the idea is you make a plot um, of this cross-section, uh, sigma, so cross-section, um, which is in uh, typically measured in barns, uh, which is equal to 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. And you do it as a function of energy. And so here's 1, 10, um, 100, uh, 1,000. Uh, this is E, the energy. Oops, sorry energy in kiloelectron volts. Um, and I have to label my other axis as well. So this is... Uh, whoops. Hmm. 
didn't get my axes quite right here, but uh, we'll take care of that. So this is 10 barns. It turns out 1 barn, um, 10 to the minus 2, uh, 10 to the minus 4 barns. And it turns out that if you just uh, plot these cross-sections, remember that for dt, we had a threshold energy of, say, 4 kiloelectron volts. So that means that we're going to have a boundary here that I have to be above 4 keV. I won't get any significant cross-section whatsoever. And the question is, how much higher than that do I have to go? And then as I go to very high energy, then the, du the triton is coming in with such a fantastic speed that uh, the interaction distance becomes smaller and smaller, uh, basically because the interaction time is going to become very small. So it, it turns out, putting all this together, what you find is that deuterium tritium has a curve that looks sort of like this. So this is dt. On the other hand, remember that we had the situation where we said, well, dd required more like 30 kilovolts, uh, or pragmatically a little bit. Um, actually, it's more like 15, 15 to 20. It depends on what you call a real threshold. It's, it's, it's a soft threshold in this case. It's really a question of when you get significant enough cross-section to have anything going on. And here... Um, so this is the D, uh, D cross-section. And then finally, I need the D helium-3, and it threads its way uh, through this business. Yep. And so this is D helium-3. You should, of course, consult the real references on this. But the thrust of what I want to try to illustrate by this is first that we're going to have to have an energy greater than you know, 10, 15, 20 kilovolts in order to have any significant cross-section, not a vanishingly small cross-section. The second thing is that it all peaks out in the range of, oh, 100 kilovolts or something like that. Uh, then the particle is coming in with too fast a speed. But the cross-section alone doesn't tell us really all of what we want to know. What we really like to know is a reaction rate or a collision frequency. And that collision frequency, um, as we've derived in some other contexts, would be n sigma v. But it turns out that usually we don't, we have in mind that we maybe have a plasma with, uh, as we'll come back to why in a little while, um, with a thermal temperature. And so it's not, this is, these experiments are done, literally, you just take a triton, you accelerate it to a certain energy, and then you hit it into a deuterium nucleus, and you see what's the cross-section. But we're going to have a whole Maxwellian distribution of particles, so we can't talk about these single particle interactions. So what happens is, instead of getting n sigma v, what we're interested in is the average of sigma v over a Maxwellian distribution function of particles. So this parameter, sigma v, is often called the reaction rate coefficient. And all we do is we take this information, the raw cross-sections, and we integrate them over a Maxwellian distribution which would be, you know, e to the minus e over t. So it would be some, you know, some function that goes down like this. Um, when you do that, then we can get this reaction rate coefficient. So let's uh, sketch what that one looks like. Um, Drawing these graphs, by the way, is hazardous as to getting them right, but we'll try. Um, and let's see, so this is going to be sigma v averaged. Uh, and it's going to be in units of uh, centimeters squared, actually, sorry, centimeters cubed per second. Uh, and it goes from 10 to the minus 20th 
um, 10 to the minus 18th, 10 to the minus 16th, and that's 10 to the minus 15th. And the ion temperature, now my range of ion temperature now is going to be lower because I've always got the tail of a Maxwellian, which will be energetic enough to produce some fusion processes, some fusion reactions. So this is Ti in kiloelectron volts, um, and this is ion temperature. We care only here about ions, of course, because electrons, uh, you know, these are all ion reactions. So this is the reaction rate um, coefficient. And maybe I should have said, well, this is just cross-section. Uh, nuclear reaction cross-section. Okay, on this, it turns out, again, DT is the um, easiest and most practical and, uh, and so forth. And it has a curve that looks sort of like this. Um, DD, that's uh, D. T. Um, DD, on the other hand, um, comes up. So this is DD and um, D helium 3. Again, a little bit more difficult yet. Uh, more difficult means to uh, here is that uh, it's difficult to get high temperatures. So um, anything that. Um, requires a higher temperature is in some sense more difficult because it requires a higher temperature plasma. Okay, so the idea I want to get at is that um, roughly speaking 10 kilovolts is about where life gets interesting or significant enough cross-section or something like that and reaction rate coefficient to make any difference and that DD, DD and D-helium-3 are uh, harder yet uh, because they require higher energy uh, and actually they have lower overall reaction rates hence the power density of what you would produce by a fusion reaction would be lower. So let me kind of just summarize then what we learn out of these nuclear uh, cross-section uh, information. So let's just call this uh, moral to story. on fusion reactions. Um, the first moral to the story is we need an ion temperature greater than or of the order of, let's say, 10 kiloelectron volts for, um, let's call it realistic reaction rate. Um, now, that's surely uh, going to be a, at that temperature, you know, certainly deuterium and tritium are going to be well ionized, right? And virtually everything is going to be rather well ionized. Is it a plasma? Well, we might have to ask a few questions about, you know, how many Debye lengths, how big the thing is, and various things like that. But generally speaking, 10 kilovolt collections of charged particles are rather likely to be plasmas, let's just say. Um, so let's say likely to be a plasma, likely to be possible only in a plasma. Uh, second comment is that the easiest reaction is DT. Um, and let's say then DD and not too much further behind D helium 3. Um, the second two, um, well, let's say the last two require um, not just 10 kilovolts but an ion temperature greater than about 30 kiloelectron volts. Um, and 
they also have lower reaction rates, which means that they would lead to uh, lower fusion power densities. Unless you're able to get higher plasma densities and, and to get the n squared sigma v reaction rate back up. The third thing, which I haven't really talked about, but I need to calibrate for you, is that the fusion collision rate, which would then be n sigma v fusion, at about 10 kilovolts, turns out to be of the order of 10 to the minus 2 times the Coulomb collision frequency, which we estimated before. We talked about Coulomb collisions in a plasma, remember, and they're kind of weak. But the idea is that fusion reactions are even weaker. Okay? So what this in some sense means is that if I want to have a plasma full of ionized particles and have them do a significant amount of fusion, I'm going to have to hold them for at least 100 Coulomb collision timescales. Because otherwise, I'd only get you know one part in a hundred of the fusion uh, of the fusion reactions possible, so I just wouldn't get enough fusion. So we must hold uh, or confine is the usual word charged particles. Or of the order of 10 to, two, 10 to the 2, you know, you know 100 um, so-called 90-degree scattering times, or scatterings, by Coulomb collisions, which are cumulative small angle and so forth. So this is why we talk about, um, okay, this leads to the consideration of plasma confinement, plus some other things we'll mention in a moment. We need to confine a plasma well, hold it long enough, 100 Coulomb collision times, roughly speaking, in order to achieve enough fusion reactions to be significant. Otherwise, you'd have a huge throughput and so forth and so on, and you may lose a lot of energy. Now, people quantify this aspect of confinement in terms of something uh, for net energy production, something called the Lawson criterion, after a British scientist, John Lawson, who developed such a criterion in the uh, 50s, in the early ages, early stages of the fusion business. Anyway, so net energy uh, production uh, and again, this is called the Lawson criterion. Um, basically, what we do is we define a factor Q, which is variously called the fusion gain factor. So it's energy out over energy in, basically. Or the fusion quality factor, or various of those things. And what it is, is it's the fusion power produced. divided by the net energy loss rate. What, uh, how much net fusion power do I produce? Well, n times nu, or n squared sigma v, would get me my reaction rate. So there's an n squared average sigma v. But then, usually, I'm thinking of things like, let's say, DD reactions. And then I can't, you know, I can't count the particles twice. And so it's n squared over 4, because then it, it, this would be the electron density, actually. And, and I have to not count the particles, or n, actually, it's nd, sorry. But anyway, I can't count the particles twice in the reaction. So I have to have nd squared over 4, nd over 2 quantity squared. And so that's my reaction rate. That's the number per second. 
How much energy do I get per fusion? Well, we had that 17.6 MeV sort of thing. And I'll just call that delta E fusion, the energy that I achieve per fusion. And then for good measure, uh, if I was producing this in the form of primarily the DT reaction, where I had that neutron, 14 MeV neutron, going out, going into a blanket, had to heat water, run the water through a turbine, convert it to electricity, there's a certain efficiency factor, about a third, maybe as high as 40 percent, 36, 40 percent, for uh, conversion of um, thermal energy to um, electrical energy. So the basic idea is the numerator is then how much fusion power is produced. How much does it cost me in that energy loss rate? Well, we've talked about an energy containment time for a plasma. So the basic idea is I have three halves, uh, N times Te plus Ti would be the stored energy in the system, and it leaks out with some energy confinement time tau sub e. So that's an energy loss rate. It turns out there's a small correction at high ener except at high energies where it becomes significant for Bremsstrahlung radiation, which we will generally not worry about. And then, well, and there could be some other line radiation problems if you had some impurities and so forth, but we're trying to be a little idealized and, and uh, optimistic here, and so we won't worry about that sort of thing. But uh, we also can have another thing, which is that, or, uh, so, so there could be additional loss processes is what I'm saying, but we'll presume we've got a clean plasma. But there's actually a gain process that you remember in the deuterium-tritium reaction, we said there was this alpha particle, helium-4, that if I could hold it in the plasma, it would give up its 3.5 MeV to the plasma particles by collisional exchange. And so I can have minus Q fusion products. But that was, remember, in the deuterium-tritium reaction, that was only of this 17.6 uh, MeV, this was only about 20%. Now, this is kind of a complicated formula, and people make a, a plot of it, okay? But you can see the sense of it if you do the following. So here comes my big approximate equal sign. And what I will do here is I will say the electron temperature is of the order of the ion temperature. So then I'll make this 3NT. Second thing I'll do is I'll neglect uh, Bremsstrahlung. So neglect, uh, actually, both Q Bremsstrahlung and uh, Q fusion product. Okay. If I do that, then you see that I have all I have left, and I can make this an ND as well now. Um, I, I will have neglected the Bremsstrahlung and the fusion products, so I'll, and I'll, I'll have taken away the. Um, the 2 and just left myself with a T. Um, so then I can cancel out that there's a density squared and a density and a tau E. So we can write this as N tau E, some factor. And then what remains is this efficiency for conversion of thermal to electrical energy, eta. Um, also, there's a uh, sigma V. Uh, for the fusion reaction. And there's a total factor of 3 times 4, 12 uh, times the ion temperature and the amount of fusion energy produced. <coughs> but everything in parentheses here except the eta uh, is basically just that nuclear reaction rate coefficient that I showed you before. So this is just some functional of ion temperature and if you remember what that graph of that reaction rate coefficient looks like, you know, it's going up pretty fast, okay? So you have to be up around 10 kilovolts to have anything significant. But the basic idea of this is that you can see then that I'm going, you can just see from this, and then we'll draw the Lawson diagram, uh, Lawson diagram that comes from the Lawson uh, criterion. Um, you can, you can see that it's going to depend upon two fundamental parameters. 
having the plasma temperature high enough, about 10 kilovolts, to get a high enough reaction rate. And this is all embodied in this nuclear reaction um, and nuclear fusion reaction um, dependent term. And then something which conveys a sense of confinement. Okay, I've got to have adequate energy containment so that this product N tau is, or is, is large enough. Okay. So this, uh, so roughly speaking, it's going to turn out this has to be 10 to the fourth per cubic centimeter second, and we have to have a temperature of about 10 kilovolts. But let me show you how that so-called Lawson diagram goes. So the idea is this is, the, this is often just called the Lawson diagram, which is a plot of N tau versus T, those being Ti, those being the two prominent uh, parameters here. So we'll make a plot of, um, let's see, this is N tau E. Um, here's 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 14th, um, and then here's 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and this is Ti in kiloelectron volts. And what you find is that this so-called Lawson criterion, which is, I didn't say that, but surely we'd like to have Q greater than 1. Otherwise, it wasn't very much of a success. We were losing more power than we got out in fusion, right? So we need Q greater than 1. So Q greater than 1 is often called the Lawson criterion. Okay, and the idea is that in this, you can make a plot of this functional of Q equal to 1, the point in N tau space and function of ion temperature at which that occurs. And that uh, is, a, is a curve, depending on the way that works, and we'll use this one. Um, looks like a curve sort of like this. And it turns out this uh, asymptote here is determined by Bremsstrahlung. So I'm not quite truthful in telling you I neglect Bremsstrahlung. We sort of take it into account. But pragmatically, the requirements for fusion then are, roughly speaking, an n tau, which I should tell you the units of, centimeters cubed second, uh, an n tau of 10 to the 14th, so n tau e greater than 10 to the 14th centimeters cubed second, and an ion temperature greater than about, these are really approximate, uh, 10 kilo electron volts uh, are what we generally need, uh, need for fusion, basically. Net, net energy out of a few controlled fusion system. Now I mentioned, so, so this is the diagram, or the, the, the curve, Q greater than 1. I mean, you know, up in here, Q is greater than 1. Uh, so let's do it this way. On the other hand, remember we had this sense that 20% of the charged particle energy goes into the background plasma. So if I could actually have Q greater than 5, I might have an energy self-sustaining reaction in the same sense that a fission system is critical. And that is called, in the fusion business, so-called ignition. And so this is Q greater than 5, and that's called ignition. Um, so the idea is that's the goal. Now, the next question you might ask is uh, how we doing? You know, roughly speaking, how do present experiments uh, or past experiments stack up to these requirements of 10 kilo electron volts and 10 to the 14th in N tau? Well, it turns out in about 1969, um, the Soviets uh, should demonstrated with a so-called T3 experiment, which kind of got everybody started on doing tokamaks. Uh, they had about 10 to the 11th and about 300 uh, electron volts or 0.3 kilovolts. 
And so in 1969, that's where we were. At the same time, that's the, the tokamak line. At the same time, there were two so-called 2x2 um, mirror experiments also in 1969, which were up around a couple, three kilovolts, but at 10 to the 10th. So in some sense, we were probably about four orders of magnitude away, maybe a little more, depending on how you count it. All through the 70s, people started building, got, I'll come back to the history in a moment, started building more ambitious devices more, and with greater enthusiasm and things started working and so forth and so on. And so there were basically tokamaks that filled a, a, to, a number of tokamak experiments, filled in things um, in this realm in the 70s. Through the 80s, and in particular just in the last year or so, the large tokamaks which were built at a cost in, in the United States, uh, Europe, the Soviet Union, and Japan, each of which costs about a, about a billion dollars, it turns out, and has about a 10, 15-year operating scale. Uh, they have achieved over 10 to the 14th, but at only a couple of 3 kilovolts, and up to 30 kilovolts ion temperature, but not at as high, an I, uh, at as high a confinement. The net result is that the 80s tokamaks have achieved, in some sense, these requirements, desired requirements, namely good enough confinement, but at lower temperature than desired, and high enough ion temperature, namely 30 kilovolts instead of uh, 10 kilovolts, but not simultaneously. The best achieved so far is done in what's called a DT equivalent experiment, where you really do it in DD, and then if you, you imagine that you had DT, about a half. And as far, while in some sense the objectives of these large-scale experiments, tokamak experiments, still remains the achievement of so-called scientific break-even, namely demonstrating that you can be above this Q equals 1 line, pragmatically most of the field feels that that scientific objective is more or less met in that things have come up about four orders of magnitude and, you know, one is within a factor of two or so. But there's still some emphasis on trying to uh, explicitly demonstrate that. And the difficulty is just one of putting together very complicated experiments and making them work and so forth and so on. Okay, I want to, uh, so this is the basic, these are the basic requirements of fusion about where things stand and the desire to get Q greater than 1, Q greater than 5. I want to talk briefly then about how a fusion reactor, uh, uh, let's call it sketch of a fusion reactor on one transparency, by the way, here. Uh, so sketch of a fusion reactor. And in some sense, contrast it a bit with fission. Basically, um, you know, we've got this plasma, which I'll just draw as a cylindrical cross-section. Uh, and we can't stick rods in there, or we can't flow coolant through, right? So in contrast to a fission reactor where the heat-producing fuel elements have water flowing right beside them, or sodium or something in a fast breeder reactor, um, in a plasma, you know, 10 kilovolts, uh, dens <coughs> densities are going to turn out to be equivalent of a pretty good vacuum and so forth and so on. Uh, you're not going to run coolant tubes through there. So you have to take out all the power through a wall, okay? So what you do is you imagine that there's a wall outside of here. But so we've got these neutrons coming out. Remember that was in our deuterium-tritium reaction, 14 MeV neutron. And we needed to have lithium-6 in there so that a neutron plus lithium-6 leads to a triton. So this is what we call a breeding blanket. Breeding mean, meaning um, to breed tritium from using the neutrons colliding with the tritons, uh, with the lithium-6 to produce tritons. Also, if we're going to talk about magnetic confinement, it turns out we're going to need an additional radiation and cooling shield. Just because it is a radioactive system. And finally, uh, uh, we're then we're going to imagine if we have a magnetic confinement scheme, 
that we're going to have, let's say, um, superconducting coils at perhaps a temperature of 4.2 degrees Kelvin, maybe higher, maybe lower, depending upon how that technology sort of works. It turns out if you go through various nuclear cross-sections, you can kind of find out that this is on the order of a little bit less than two meters of thickness outside the plasma. So ultimately, it turns out you're going to talk about a plasma radius, which is also one to two meters. Otherwise, it'd be kind of in funny geometry. Um, it turns so in contrast to a fission system where the where you run the coolant right where the power is produced. In a fusion system, you have to take all that power out through a wall, and I haven't drawn you know all the way around here, but you have to take that power out through a wall. Wall loadings turn out to be on the order of one megawatt or greater per meter squared. And it turns out if you limit yourself to uh, neutron damages of order 100 dPa, 100 displacements per atom, which is quite a beating on the material, this leads to a wall lifetime, as it's called, of the order of a few megawatt years per meter squared, which means that you would have to replace the first wall, uh, which would be right around here, every couple of three years. Um, basically, also, you have to, in, these, in the breeding blanket, you also have to take power out of that, put it into heating water some way or other, turn turbines, and create electricity. So to finish this up, let's just say that um, if you imagine a deuterium-tritium system, tritium is, not per, is radioactive, but in some sense it's confinable for the most part. The neutron activation level in a fusion system is in some sense down by a couple orders of magnitude, in fact, about 100 in induced radioactivity compared to the fission system because it doesn't produce the, um, the split, uh, you know, the fission fragments, which are quite uh, radioactive. So it's not negligible by any means, down a couple orders of magnitude. On the other hand, its half-life of that after heat, let's call it, is only 300 years as opposed to 20,000 years in a fission system. So a fusion reactor system is not it is a nuclear system, but it is thought by many people to have potential advantages of a couple orders of magnitude in time scale and, and level of radioactivity. Okay, we'll quit now for a little while, and then I'll come back and we'll talk about a brief history of the fusion program and what people have tried in various ways to make a fusion system work.